Welcome to the Claude Hocott Lectureship in Petroleum Engineering. And um, we are privileged to have our guest today, Tony Pink, who's the Chief Technical Officer of NOV Wellboard Technologies, is going to talk to us today about drilling automation. Let me just tell you a little bit about Tony before um, I give him the floor here. I'm glad to welcome a fellow geologist to our, to our podium. Um, Although I can't rep, I, I can't pronounce the uh, University College of Aber Wales. Yeah, Aberystwyth. Yeah, Aberystwyth. Aber yeah. yeah. Aber <laughs> <Rist with>, huh? <laughs> All right, and he also has a um, uh, postgraduate diploma from Harvard Business School. He worked for Schlumberger for a while and then moved to NOV. Um, he was the VP of Automated Drilling Applications, then became the VP of uh, Dynamic Drilling Solutions. And now, as I said before, he's the Chief Technical Officer of NOV's Wellboard Technologies. He's responsible for digital strategy and technology portfolio for the segment, including geothermal drilling. And um, he's also responsible for a geothermal research project between NREL, which is a National Renewable Energy Lab, and NOV. Um, he's a distinguished author and distinguished speaker. Um, I will give him the floor to tell us about automated drilling. Fantastic. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks, John. And uh, let's uh, let's go for this sharing thing now. Share screen. And we hope we get it in presentation mode. First time up. Presentation mode. Yeah. Looks, looks great. great. Okay. You're all set. So I'll do my best here in a, in a very short time to give you guys and girls a good... Um, sort of insight into uh, into drilling automation and, and now into digitalization. And, uh, you know, many of you are, you know, probably I'm sure sitting there thinking about what does the future of uh, for petroleum engineers and geologists and all of us in the oil and gas world uh, do it. Well, the good thing with drilling automation is it does uh, lead into, you know, the, the one drilling that probably needs drilling automation more than anything else is probably geothermal. So I, I, I see our industry being back, you know, in, in the in the not too distant future. So hang out there doing some postgrad stuff so you get your timing right and uh, hopefully you'll hit the hit the ground running in it. And if not, we'll we'll go and start drilling for very hot water and uh, and turn that into uh, into energy. Yeah. So the uh, the history. Um, so really, you know, automation has of, of some degree or mechanization uh, has been around in our industry for, for quite a while. I, I, was, um, I was actually on, uh, you know, a rig that had had a very early uh, top drive installed in it and a, and a very early auto driller. So even back in there at the, in the very late 90s and uh, early uh, eight, early, late 80s and early 90s, there, there was a degree of automation already out on the rig. Yeah? Even if it was, you know, a human adjusting a pressure uh, 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 airflow valve to pull a brake handle to maintain a, uh, uh, a downhole weight on bit, it was, it was still a degree of automation. Yeah, And as time has gone by now, you know, our industry you know, as, as the economics become more and more challenging, has needed more and more automation. And as, as we move into uh, the uh, 20s, um, we're going to see, uh, you know, very challenging economics. So if we're going to produce oil at the prices that we need, we're going to have to start thinking about drilling wells like a Toyota uh, factory. Yeah? We're really going to have to apply Six Sigma processes to drilling wells uh, make sure that we're repeating uh, things and measuring things so that we can repeat them over and over again. And I'll talk about sort of some of the technology that starts to make that uh, easier and easier. Uh, in, um, in NOV, the journey I, I took, which really started in 2010 with the drilling systems automation technical section in SPE, who uh, Professor Van Ort was uh, one of the early pioneers in, in as well, is we, we were looking at what did our industry uh, need. And, and at the second go around of that, NOV, that nothing had happened. 
And then OV suddenly thought that maybe the glue in this automation space had to come from an equipment manufacturer. So we started uh, two projects. Um, one was closed loop downhole automation that was taking data from downhole tools and bringing it up to the surface uh, and using that to drive the rigs control system. And the other one was developing a process controller called uh, Novos, yeah? And I'll tell you about some of, some of those as we go through this, yeah? So for NOV, and really the big, the big uh, automation things in drilling is, is drilling process control. So that is taking um, the uh, prescribing a uh, action and then following that process step by step. So when we were mapping this out, it was unbelievable when we wrote the steps to make a connection. And, and we, we had this huge conference room that was as big as a racquetball court with white walls. And so we started writing the steps out. And in, in the end, we were getting down to writing, you know, like tiny, tiny print filling in the gaps that we had to, in the end, train this process controller to, to think of just for putting the bit on bottom, you know, thousands of lines around this uh, thing. So that's, that's, you've got to really truly define that process uh, control. The next one is multi-machine control. So that is making sure that different machines hand off to each other to do tasks, yeah? So, uh, and I'll show you a bit of that, what that looks like on the, on the rig floor, where a pipe handler hands off to an iron roughneck that hands off to a draw works so that the whole rig uh, runs like a, uh, a machine. And when, when you do that, you start to think of the total rig floor as a giant robot, yeah? Then there are different processes going on on there that, that are a robot, that are robotics, yeah? And we're actually now in 2020 moving into having a robot designed for a, a land rig. You know, the, the, the land rig world is, the economics are very tough. Um, you know, to replace a human is, 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 is hardly worth it. But we found a, a, a sort of, lightweight industrial from an iron mill uh, robot that we're basically using to handle pipe on the on the rig floor and then the last big bit of it was closed loop downhole automation yeah and i'll talk about that so the process controller yeah so really what you're creating is a reflexive drilling system yeah you're you're uh, creating this system that follows through all these steps to completely control the process once you start controlling that process, you then really can start to understand where there are uh, performance limitations and where things are not working, and then you can tweak that process. If you don't have that repeatability of process, it's really hard to put a continuous improvement, a Six Sigma type process into the, into the system. The other thing we, we uh, uh, did was develop it as an open platform. Yeah? The idea being that uh, anybody out there, both in academia, other industries, small startups, could write applications that would uh, control the, the system. Yeah? So if we looked at you know, what the poor driller was, uh, was doing, you know, a driller um, in the, in, in the, before uh, process control came out was really a, a glorified uh, uh, crane driver. Yeah. He was having to manually control all these different processes, you know, hoist up, open slips, start pumps, turn on this. And uh, each driller did it in their own way. And when you watch that data, you could really see how different, the big difference there was between a driller who was a uh, 10 years experience, a craftsman and a newbie on the, uh, on the rig. Yeah. So we then get, we introduce the, the process controller. Now the driller turns the process controller on and the uh, uh, software completely takes control and follows a predetermined plan that we've loaded into the system. So most drilling operators out there will, will provide a framework plan and say, I want to go put the bit on the bottom with uh, um, 10,000 uh, foot, uh, pounds of weight and then I'll rapidly ramp that up to 30 and that would be prescribed into the drilling plan and then the Novos system would follow follow that plan and, and automatically drill, ream, survey, whatever the process is uh, that, it, that it needs to do. Yeah. What it does then is it gives uh, consistency 
across the entire fleet. So one of the large drilling contractors in the, in the US and Canada pretty well has no, uh, no boss on lots and lots of its rigs. Yeah? And they really saw that the, the, the competency or the, or the performance of the, uh, of, the, of the rigs all started to float up. Yeah? So as the, the, the best driller on the crew programmed the process controller, then the rest of the drillers all were lifted up. So this huge sort of floating, uh, raising competency uh, uh, occurred. You know, lots of drilling tasks are really, really repetitive, yeah? I, I was personally on the break when I was a directional driller in Venezuela, and, and one time, you know, we were doing a kickoff super deep at about 15,000 feet. So we drilled 15,000 feet vertically and then kicking off very deep. And we had really terrible drag in the well. And me and that driller had to take sort of an hour to go to try and drill ahead, concentrating. And we basically used to have to pick the whole assembly up, free fall, drop it, and then catch it with the brake and then squeeze out a couple of feet. And both of us were completely fried by the end of it. So those tasks, you know, uh, you know, it's the same as the pilots used to fight autopilot. You know, now they all enjoy uh, all but a few minutes of uh, flying. They, don't, they fly the plane for a few minutes probably these days um, and leave everything to the auto driller. And it's interesting if you look at the airline industry and how, you know, behind we are from them, you know, uh, directional drilling, which was one of my jobs, is, is basically navigation. And when did any of us see a navigator on an airplane? Yeah. So why do we have directional drillers on rigs? Yeah? And so uh, as these tasks become more op uh, automated, we'll start to see a change out of people on the rig and then the enablement of, uh, uh, of uh, remote control. So here the graph just shows you the sort of that, that consistency uh, that occurs once you put the process controller in there, yeah? I mean, the process controller may not be as fast as the absolute best connection that is made by uh, uh, a manual driller, but you look at the standard deviation of that is seriously reduced, yeah? So it's really, really tight um, spacing of the, of the performance on the rig, yeah? And then, you know, the, the speed that it puts into and the consistency it puts into that. But then when you tie that back to a sort of continuous improvement process, you take, um, like in this case, when the bit was being put on bottom, and, it, and, and what surprised everyone was that most bits in the, in the US were being put on bottom too slowly. So when the bit was put on bottom really slowly, what happened was the cutting structure of the bit didn't generate the, the profile on the bottom of the hole, the bit would go into reverse whirl and shake around and you would damage the cutters from the backside. So once you taught the process controller that I will go on bottom in a fast but steady way, the bit then cut its shape, it, it stabilized itself with the cone of rock in the middle and then uh, became very stable. And all of a sudden now you're getting these uh, bit runs that are a thousand feet longer. The rate of penetration is 10, 15, 20 feet faster because the process controller has eliminated a uh, process that was debilitating to the, to the drilling process. Yeah? So you start to get that sort of continuous learning process. But when you know, a group of engineers have analyzed that process, found the limitation, they need a way of transferring that knowledge back out to the field. Without a process controller, you're then so reliant on the competency of the person that you uh, have out in the field. So we saw the early days of drilling optimization really struggled because you didn't have things out in the field, a, a processor to, to, to drive those uh, changes, yeah? So to see how it uh, works is really quite simple. So the driller will uh, tag bottom or not tag bottom, turn Novos on, and then Novos will refer to the plan and then select the various uh, machines that it needs to communicate with and talk to the, uh, the pumps, the draw works, the uh, top drive, and select according to the drilling roadmap what, rate, what RPM it needs to have, what flow rate it needs to have, and how fast it needs to lower the pipe, and then interact between uh, those different tools to maintain the, uh, uh, the forward going uh, performance. Yeah. 
So that's the process controller. So that's uh, having a uh, intelligent system to follow a roadmap that has been put into the uh, um, into the into the well program that the drill the drilling rig is now adopting as a process control. So the next thing you now need to do is synchronize those ma machines. Yeah? So in many cases on land, you, we we you don't have what's called multi machine control. Yeah. Uh, you have the process controller, but the individual handoff between machines uh, in the tripping process is, is not required because the economics aren't there. But in the next few slides, what you'll see is a, is a super uh, uh, efficient offshore rig in the, in the, in the, in the North Sea uh, that is running multi-machine control. So multi-machine control is now all these different machines are tied to each other and they have situational awareness between the machines for uh, doing the process they need to do efficiently, but also to make sure that uh, one machine doesn't crash into the other because it's out of uh, synchronization. So that's really what multi-machine control is, yeah? So, so you can see here on the, on the, on the rig in, the, in the, the various pieces of kit. So you got your pipe handling kit, uh, equipment. So this is all the things that are taking the pipe out of the derrick and they've got to be synchronized with the uh, uh, draw works, which is going to pull up and pick up the, uh, the top drive. Yeah? So you will have the multi-machine uh, um, control software loaded in the, uh, the doghouse. And uh, if none of you have ever been out on a North Sea uh, uh, rig or a Gulf of Mexico offshore rig, the the world that I knew where the uh, you know the uh, the rain and the sleep was coming in through the door and hitting me in the face is is gone now. It really looks much more like the Starship Enterprise and uh, these uh, guys and girls are sitting in relative comfort in uh, Porsche designed chairs. Yeah. So uh, unfortunately, I didn't have that luxury. I I also had the the joy of a of a giant jungle moth coming through a fan and being shot at my head at 20 miles an hour. Yeah. But anyway, the world moves on and it's all pretty cool. So I'm actually going to get to go out to one of these. The other thing is just like pilots, you've got to have, um, you know, th these people need to practice. Yeah. And, and it's not, doesn't make economic sense for them to practice on a rig that's costing $750,000 a day. So, uh, um, those of you at UT are familiar with one of our dome simulators. Yeah? So uh, we basically have the software uh, loaded up for all of these machines for the various rigs. So someone from, um, you know, Maersk is going to come in and sit on his rig floor and use the uh, simulator. And just like our industry is going to have to adapt in the future where, you know, things become more and more automated, the drillers and the drill crew, we're going to have to simulate events for them like pilots, yeah? so they get to see um, a, you know, a stuck pipe event or a uh, kick so that they, they start to see that uh, those events that they don't see regularly. Yeah? And that, that actually is a gap in our, in our industries. Uh, well, is a true drilling simulator. Uh, we have equipment simulators and we have some drilling capability, but not a true drilling uh, uh, simulator. So just as we saw for the, uh, the ability for the driller with the process controller to manage things, the same occurred for the assistant driller who was trying desperately to make all these things up in a consistent uh, way. Yeah? And uh, the repercussions of not making up draw pipe in a consistent way is either damaging a very expensive asset, or in some cases, if you don't make up that draw pipe in a, uh, uh, to the right uh, makeup talk, it's going to come apart downhole. And uh, coming apart downhole is going to be losing millions of dollars worth of equipment in the hole and or fishing it out at $700,000 a day. So the economics of having uh, multi-machine control in the offshore world are definitely there. So this is what they, uh, the, the, the view looks like uh, for, the, uh, for the assistant driller. And really, all he controls with the joystick is actually the speed of things to occur. So the machines are all talking to each other, but the, uh, uh, the, the joystick itself is just speeding up the, the, the process. So let's have a look 
at a couple of these just quickly so you get an idea of how this works. So, here the piston driller in the cabin is just uh, you know, controlling the speed, the speed is just bringing everything out, loading it into, in this case, an iron rock neck. And the, uh, uh, the iron rock neck is taking up the pipe, the draw work is lowering it, feeding it into the iron rock neck, and the iron rock neck is uh, making up the uh, the, the And then the same goes here. Here's the uh, all these different machines talking to themselves, talking to each other as they trip out of the hole as well. So, so the uh, draw work is pulling the pipe out. The, the racker is going is going to get ready to pick up the uh, uh, the joint. So it's already aligned. So it's, it's grabbing hold, but already the uh, this this is. It's now got hold of this, but the top drive is already on its way down uh, so that it gets ready to uh, do this. By doing all these steps in a systematic way, it, the, the whole system can be sped up. And what we've um, been seeing on uh, it's the uh, noble Bob Douglas down in uh, drilling in Guyana is when they were first got that rig going and they were running manually, it was taking about uh, seven minutes to make a, a connection. They've now tuned every single little step of this, now make the connection in about two minutes and 30 seconds. There's a huge time difference in tipping uh, out the hole. So all of these things are now synchronized and it gets more and more like a, uh, uh, a choreographed uh, ballet or a dance all these machines just are working simultaneously together. Previously, the, the poor assistant driller was doing one at a time, so the whole process ran in uh, series rather than in, uh, in, in parallel. So. so, you know, when you start to pull all these bits together, you, you start to get this uh, topology of, of uh, you know, particularly in the offshore world of a process controller, which is then handing off to multi-machine control, uh, choreographs the machines, and then we, uh, you know, we 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 start to automate all those processes, drive the performance limitations out of those uh, uh, processes, and and improve the overall uh, drilling speed. The one thing missing was we're doing all this based on surface data only. Yeah, so. Uh, we're, we're getting data from all the sensors on the on the rig's uh, surface, uh, but no no real downhole data. Uh, I'm, I'm sure most of you are aware, but maybe some of you aren't, that uh, data comes up from downhole, typically on what's called mud pulse, yeah? So the fastest mud pulse out there is probably uh, Schlumberger's uh, siren type uh, MWD, so it produces a sine wave. It's a, 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 a the modulator spins and speeds up and slows down to give you a to give you a sine wave. And on a really good day, that transmits data up hole at about 24 bits per second. Yeah. So we're not talking about me being able to talk to you on video today at whatever uh, gigahertz we're uh, communicating in. This is this is bits per second. Yeah. So all this data that we need, pressure, temperature, the formations we're drilling through, the direction in which we're going, all of this is coming up almost in uh, smoke signals. Yeah? So we were very lucky to um, purchase a company that had a technology called Wired Drill Pipe. Yeah? And Wired Drill Pipe um, is basically a internet connection to the bottom of the hole. It's not really fast, but imagine going from 24 bits per second to now to uh, 57,000 bits a second. So we're now start to connect everything that we've got on the surface from automation. We're now taking that data and now can we drive the machines using downhole data? So 
the next step of the automation sort of journey was to bring in uh, closed loop automation. Yeah. So mud pulse telemetry is that equivalent of the smoke signals coming up. And then we had wired drill pipe, 57,000 bits per second. Yeah. And uh, I mean, you know, a whole nother story could be told about how our industry is very slow at adopting things. Yeah. Um, you know, how most ideas like the top drive took uh, at least a decade to become standard. Yeah. And that pretty well goes for our industry. It's quite, uh, we're, we're quite conservative and uh, there, there could be a whole class discussion on why are we slow at adopt, so slow at adopting technology. Wired drill pipe has, has just started to become mainstream in the uh, in the offshore world. We have a, a number of jobs running in, uh, in in UK and Norway at the moment, and we've had uh, a fair number in, in, in US. And what that does is, uh, it, it, we, what we simply did was, we have a, a joint drill pipe. We put an inductive coil in the, uh, in the end of the uh, drill pipe. So and because it's induction, it doesn't have to uh, touch. It can actually uh, jump, the signal can jump from one inductive coil. We gun drill through the pipe uh, tool joints, and then the uh, armored uh, coax comes out on the inside of the tube, yeah? And then it goes down to the box end where we have a, another inductive coil. And uh, the, you screw the box and the, and the pin together and the, uh, the two uh, make up. They, they normally just, just about touch or do touch. Um, and then the signal, the 57,000 bits a second signal jumps, uh, jumps across. To amplify this, we have a booster about every uh, uh, 1,500 uh, feet. So once you once you've got the uh, uh, wired drill pipe in the hole, now you can now start to build applications that derive off that data. So um, we've recently been building applications. So the f first one, uh, envelope protection. So what envelope protection does is as you're pulling out of the hole with the pipe, um, it monitors the long string pressures in the well bore and will slow down the machines on the surface that are pulling the pipe out of the hole. So if you've, had, if you've got a draw works on the surface, big, big crane winch, and it starts to the, uh, pull out of the hole with the, mul with the multi-machine control, with Novos saying, right, we're pulling out of the hole at this speed because that's what the plan said. So now the plan becomes adaptive, yeah? So the envelope protection says, oh, if we carry on pulling at this speed, we're going to swab the formation and potentially induce a kick. So rather than the, uh, the driller discovering that and taking a kick and then having to shut the well in, the envelope protection app is now automatically slowing down the draw works so that we don't swab the well bore. Uh, True drill. Uh, was is an application that uh, now instead of drilling with the surface data so if you've got all this drill string in the hole and you've got a bottom hole assembly and you're drilling with weight on bit all you know on the surface is how much weight have I lost somewhere between the surface and the bottom of the hole you don't know how much is actually on the drill bit and how much is being lost into the side of the borehole lying on the low side uh, a formational drag, whatever that is. So, so we built True Drill to derive off a downhole weight on bit. So, as you drill these horizontal wells in West Texas, and the well gets further and further out, a greater percentage of the pipe is lying on the bottom of the hole. The pipe also buckles, so you have side forces. So, True Drill then took all that into consideration so that you could drill the well maintaining the downhole weight on bit. The only challenge we have with True Drill is measuring that downhole weight on bit uh, is quite a challenging measurement because you have all sorts of stresses and strains in the in the steel itself, and actually sometimes the the differential in pressure, uh, sorry, differential in temperature can induce significant errors in the in the measurement. So this this. Uh, it is, it's a good measurement, it's a good application, but it does have some limitations, yeah. 
the application that's been sort of really, really changing the use of wire drill pipe has been a, a long string fluid density. That's what EFD stands for. So we can now image the borehole uh, in different colors for different weights in real time uh, in the well bore. So on the little graphic, you have a slice of the well in the vertical axis, and then you have time on the horizontal axis. So you can see how the weight of the fluid is changing in time. Yeah? And what that means is then you can start to get cause and effect. So you say, oh, I'm, I'm drilling really fast here. I've got too, mu too much rock in my mud. I, I'm not cleaning the hole properly. I better either slow down for a little bit or I need to uh, increase the flow rate and get that rock out of the hole. Otherwise, I've got a risk of getting stuck. Yeah. And then the... the Last sort of app that we uh, have out commercial at the moment is called Kaizen, which is obviously the, the sort of Japanese for optimization. Um, and that is a very, very clever um, sort of AI engine that understands what's going on in your well, understands what you've done, uh, looks for um, a sort of highest performance, lowest energy in output, and also uh, reads off however many offset wells you've put in there. So the AI engine reads off what you've been doing on offset wells, learns what it's done in the last, you know, uh, 25, 50, 75, 100 feet, and, the, and it learns, and then it tries to find a sweet spot. Uh, as good as this is, it still needs a reasonable degree of intellectual input in it to minimize the amount of time that it spends searching and maximize the amount of time it spends uh, exploiting. Yeah. So uh, another app that we built was real-time vibration management. And what you can see, you see on the green trace, the very high, uh, large uh, green strokes on the gyro mean RPM, zero to 150. That, that meant we had a phenomenon called uh, stick slip. So super high stick slip, which also resulted in high lat lateral vibrations. On this blue trace, on the second uh, track, we take off the, uh, uh, turn, turn the controller on, and the vibration in the stick slip completely goes away. Turn it off again, and we get full stick slip. And the, and the stick slip and the acceleration associated with the slip phase uh, generally causes significant damage to PDC bits. So if we're going to drill fast in very hard rock in geothermal wells, we're going to have to really control this environment. And I, I'm really looking forward to doing some real drilling optimization in, in, in geothermal wells. Yeah. So another example of the fluid density, just to sort of tell a little story, this is something I presented at an SPE uh, um, uh, meeting. So we're, we're drilling along. And we we get a pack off in the well bore. That means all the cuttings have jammed off the pipe, and so we have to shut off the pumps. Yeah. So if we had mob pulse in the hole, we wouldn't have any idea what was going on in the well bore. But in this case, we had wired drill pipe, and we had downhole sensors connected up to the automation system on the surface. Yeah. So we now knew that the pack off wasn't around the bottom hole assembly. It was around between a long string measurement one and a long string measurement two. That meant we could be much, much more aggressive at solving uh, that problem. Uh, and in, in this case, the customer had got stuck on the previous two wells. And this one, they managed to get free uh, and finish drilling the section and save themselves a considerable amount of money. So all these data and, and, and absorbing this data uh, is is what's driving into the last part of this presentation, which is the digitalization. Yeah. So the big challenge is that we have with we're, we're almost on information overload these days. Yeah. So we're uh, starting to uh, see the digital revolution come in come into our uh, industry. Yeah. So in this very tough time that we're living in in uh, in in 2020. So. Why do we need digitalization? You know, we, we've seen an industry that fundamentally, for the previous 30 years that I was in it, we, we could make money with our eyes closed. Yeah? 
the value of a barrel of oil and the amount that we produced and the amount it cost us to produce that barrel meant that the economics of even relatively poor oil wells were, were pretty good, yeah? And then we saw from 2014 to 2018, you know, capital coming into our industry and exploiting that in, in, in many cases in a, in a using false economics, yeah? So now we've woke to, woken up in the 2020 world of COVID-19, uh, too much oil, not enough uh, consumption. So we're going to have to get like Toyota. Yeah. So we're going to have to do everything I've already shown you, automation. And now we're going to have to consume that data and really start to squeeze out some significant improvements in performance gains. Yeah. The big, big crew change is coming in. Yeah? Um, well, coming, it's, it's gone, yeah. So I am now, um, I don't know what the ages of everyone online is, but I, I'm, I, uh, I feel that I'm a very young 52 year old, but I, I have become the oldest person when I visit my customers' offices, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I almost say, I, I meet some of the drilling engineers and, and go, you know, same as uh, the driller went to me when I stepped onto the Arch Throne in the North Sea in 1990. Does your mum know you're here, you know? And uh, it, it really is, you know, we've got to take the remaining expertise, you know, out of people's heads and, and, and put it into software. We've got to capture that knowledge, that, that, that tribal knowledge that was developed over decades and make sure that it's writ written into applications and software to, to do what that generation did by having hundreds of them scattered across the world and their expertise out on site. Yeah. We're just not going to have the people to do that. Having people on site, you know, I, I spent 10 years offshore. You know, I, I don't know that even if uh, the opportunity was there that my children would particularly want to spend 10 years out on an oil rig. They probably think their dad was daft. Yeah. Um, so we, we've got a project going at the moment for Equinor to build a semi-submersible for the Arctic that has only 50 people on it. So that rig today probably has 200, 220 people on it. So how are we going to run a rig with only 50 people on it in the Arctic safely? Yeah. Um, the digitalization needs to enable automation and remote operations. Yeah. And we're going to have to drill more and more challenging reservoirs. So the reservoir engineer needs to digest, engineers need to digest millions more data points to optimize that, that reservoir. Yeah. So it's a tough world out there. So we say in NOV that it's a really dirty job getting clean data, yeah, you know, which is in our industry really is, yeah. Uh, we're in very cold places, very dirty places, very hot places. And the data we have from our very disconnected industries coming from at least 300 data sources out there talking multiple uh, different languages, yeah. So we really need to start uh, going down a path so that the poor data scientist can actually digest this stuff. So I have lots and lots of stories of the, uh, the drilling of the um, oil and gas operators out there who have hired lots of data scientists who for the last two years have done nothing but clean up data rather than use the data. Yeah? Or they've spent ages cleaning it up and now they're, now they're using it. So where our industry is going uh, and where us in NOV are kind of helping to drive this is, is to really sort of start to um, build a system that provides universal translation, yeah? So we in NOV really understand machine, yeah? We, 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 all, we joke that, you know, uh, we're bilingual, we speak English and machine, yeah? and talk to these various data sources, which is a drilling rig, a frack crew, a core tubing unit, a production thing, and be able to digest at the edge that data, you know? So the, a data scientist can now drive an analytic out to the edge where our industry runs and be able to see that, uh, that data um, and, and use that data to, to perform better. So to do that, we built an edge system we're again staying with the premise that we did with the process controller of having an open platform. Yeah. So uh, the university of Texas, the rapid group can write apps and we, I just talked to Eric this morning and we're going to 
uh, uh, provide this software so that students moving forward can write on this software platform. It'll ne it'll need a bit of support, but you know we're already uh, consuming um, multiple languages uh, data. So build an API. If a student wraps something up in writes something in Java, we've got a Java API so that their app can then be put on the platform and talk to any rig or any completion uh, system out there. Uh, we're building it so that if you lose, if you, it, it works both on the edge and in the cloud. If you lose the connection between the, the cloud and the edge, then the rig still carries on doing what it needs to do. Yeah. Um, and I, I believe over the next uh, uh, five to 10 years, you'll see the edge really become a lot more dominant, not just in drilling, but in, in, in other industries as well. But a very complex, but try to boil it down to as simple as possible is what do we have to do with that data is, is, is first of all, capture it all, yeah? In the right formats and, and, and do, and what we, we say is we're building the Rosetta Stone of, uh, of drilling data, yeah? So we're boiling it down, wrangle it, so contextualize it, normalize it, and, and make sure that it is good and we identify bad data, and if we can backfill bad data and correct it, then do that. And then provide a platform for advanced analytics, yeah? So that's so uh, clever people like yourselves can write, at, write apps that can be put out on the system uh, and then deliver a value, you know? And, and the cool thing is, is that it starts to then uh, provide a, a platform that, you know, it's a clever student in uh, UT writing an app on our platform uh, gives the student access to multiple rigs very quickly. And it gives us, the owner of the platform, that iPhone type environment where the more and more apps that deliver uh, value, the better. Uh, we, I can promise we will never have a system that's as easy to use as, uh, as an iPhone, but we'll, we'll do our best to get somewhere there where it is easy. And then what we're doing with the visualization is we're building out this huge library of widgets and graphs and, uh, and things. So if, if, you, if you're uh, the person who's written the code, you, you can have a gauge is already made, you know, a graph's made, a scatter plot, a uh, drilling optimization view, you know, all those things, once they're built once, then the, they can consume, become the visual tool for the, for the different things, yeah? So just to give you a, 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 a quick look here is some of the user interface that we've already uh, developed, yeah? So you can see on the bottom uh, uh, image, that's the drilling optimizer, yeah? So that's the cone, uh, uh, cone drilling uh, thing, which is, came, uh, that originates from Pradeep from uh, University of Texas. So we have Pradeep's analytics built into, uh, in, into the system, yeah? And the idea with this digital landscape is to, is to maximize the ecosphere, yeah? So you have the platform on the bottom that does all the, 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 the wrangling, capture, uh, contextualizing. And then you have the various verticals, yeah? And so our sort of nirvana that we're trying to complete is that a data point from drilling can be referenced against completion and against production. Today, that is absolutely impossible, yeah? Um, so we're, we're building out the different verticals so that uh, they fit on the platform. The other today is uh, us going down the path of renewables yeah so doing this same data capture on uh, on wind turbines and then i literally just had a chat the other day with norfolk and southern uh, railroad who uh, said oh so you guys understand machine do you and uh, a top drive lying horizontally is basically the same as a diesel locomotive yeah so uh, uh, they said oh it's really cool that you know an American manufacturing company starting to think about how to talk to machines in the edge and poor connectivity because a, a rail locomotive when it goes through West Texas has as poor connectivity as a drilling rig yeah so uh, their problems are just like like ours yeah so that's the digital world we're trying to sort of create and the, and it's not just NOV there's partners you know if you see in the little blocks is NOV and then uh, uh, other partners and uh, 
and academic academia and whatever just to open this ecosphere as much as ecosystem as much as we can with the end game being this yeah so I'm, I'm, I'm coming to a close so I've got a nice little video just to show you at the very end but uh, so we think about this world of downhole tools which are getting more and more sophisticated we're um, I, I had a chat with a company the other day who are basically building a borehole MRI yeah so you can see a uh, three-dimensional image of the borehole and if you do two of them back to back then you can see how that changes shape with time so one tool comes past and then another tool comes past 24 hours later and you can see the shape of the borehole has changed from circular to ovate so now we get an understanding of what the principal uh, pressure uh, uh, principal pressure formation direction is we then have tools along the string now and we have high speed data we have robotics on the rig floor and and multi machine control we have process control and then we build or our ecosystem builds uh, applications to consume that data there's changes in connectivity coming around the the, um, the new uh, low uh, orbit satellite array that's going up in the next couple of years that's going to give us decent connectivity to across the whole planet yeah so we should be able to talk to any rig anywhere in the world but you know there's plenty of rigs like out offshore that have fiber run out to them and they have pretty good connectivity and then we have to get that in front of experts in the office yeah because we're going to have a hell of a lot less people in our industry so the few really good subject matter experts have to you know look after a lot of rigs uh, simultaneously yeah and be a lot more collaborative so that the data gets to Schlumberger, Halliburton, and Baker and we and we have that view and then we sit there in the middle with a uh, you know a remote operation center and and obviously considering the world we're in today that remote operation center doesn't even need to be a physical building anymore you know it can just be you know the experts remotely hooked up and have the ability to uh, to see what's going talk back to the rig and then uh, drive the process back into the process controller so it does it automatically yeah so this is aura which is a new thing that we're building uh, right now which is a sort of equivalent of a heads up display for the rig floor so this is uh, uh, not commercial we, we have shown this to Equinor and you'll you'll see they were in the in the room but it's kind of tying everything that I've said today together so taking that that data from the tools down hole and uh, you know most of those tools are not not NOV tools that's the the big service companies the data comes up wire pipe you know and turns the lights on down hole as we say and it comes into uh, um, this is Ascapop, which is a uh, uh, the name of a rig. It's a uh, Viking uh, uh, um, mythological character. So Ascapop has been kitted out with absolutely everything. So this is the Aura display, where the driller can see everything that's going on in in video on his uh, uh, of what's going on. So this is us doing this in uh, in one of the simulators like you have in the in the university um, in in Christian stand uh, and these are the Equinor guys seeing what's uh, going on in real time the extension of this is taking this so that this display isn't even on the rig anymore so this display is on land and then you're doing all the drilling and seeing everything that's going on from the rig so the way I've believe uh some of the operators are going to do first of all they'll move it to the accommodation so there's no one on the rig floor and then see if they can do it from land yeah but uh it's, it's going to be a uh, uh slow transition but it's, it's it's pretty exciting to see the opportunity for us to actually have the ability to, to drill um remotely from the accommodation and then eventually remotely from uh, uh, land so technically capable of doing it but the big question is uh, is our is our industry culturally ready to do it so uh, we'll see but uh, it's, uh, it's 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 a pretty uh, pretty cool uh, pretty cool story yeah.
So there you go. I'm almost a little bit, a couple of minutes uh, over. So open uh, the the floor to some uh, to some questions from uh, from the audience. Yeah. So thanks a lot, Tony. Um, you know, we got plenty of time for questions. So um, I'd recommend if you're asking a question to turn your video on too, so Tony can see you. Uh, let me look at. I, uh, can ahead. you guys hear me? Yep. Hi there. Um, hey, Tony. It's Isabel. I'm. I'm yeah. not going to turn my video on because I'm okay. literally in bed. I'm not going to lie. It's very. Right, that's early. all right. I, I and I do know what Isabel looks like, so that's all right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and just for um, clarification, Isabel is in Australia. Yeah, Most people is, may yeah. not know yeah. this, but that's why she's in bed. Yeah. And Isabel, <laughs> Isabel was an in, intern of ours uh, last last summer. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I had a great time. It was really, really fun. I recommend it to anyone who has the option. Um, but um, you touched on this briefly, um, and I sort of wanted to just bring it up again, because I'm really curious to know, when you deal with rig contractors and you talk about automation, like obviously in my mind when I think automation, I know it breeds complacency. You know, you have your auto drillers and you have your set and forget, and I've seen it happen, you know? Yeah. And yeah. so when, when you talk to big contractors now, like how dedicated are they to this idea of actually, I guess, running simulators and training their guys properly? Because like, I mean, yeah, you would have seen it and I've seen it. You have guys on the rig, you know, you go out one hitch and he's, you know, the derrickman. And this happens more so on land than it does offshore. You know, you go out one hitch, he's a derrickman. And then, you know, six months later, he's now a driller. Whereas like, you know, offshore back in the day, you might have been an AD for, you know, six years and then you got made up to driller. And so I guess my question is, how committed are companies yeah, to so actually building simulators? And are you guys pushing that? Yeah, so two, two I mean, uh, you know, the incentivization was one, one of the keys, yeah? So I have noticed that uh, one of the drilling contractors who really visionary, you know, they created the incentive of, the amount of time that the uh, that the the driller himself used the process controller became something that was uh, uh, he was rewarded for. Prior to that, the he, the behavior mechanism was to try and beat the process controller. Yeah, and so you had this yeah. complete lack of adoption because the driller would go, "Well, I can beat the machine." Yeah, um, and now that drilling contractor is very is being very successful. On the simulation side at the moment, well, with the churn through our industry at the moment, I would say it's probably very uh, limited, yeah? So, uh, you know, bar a few exceptions um, where you've got some really sophisticated rigs in the Gulf of Mexico and the North Sea that are starting to do some new and challenging things, that, that, that dedication to using simulators is, is not there. And then the other thing that the true drilling simulator of you know uh, simulated uh, you know drilling performance and getting you know training you to be a drilling racing driver that that software doesn't exist today yeah so you know to be able to play on a simulator almost like a video game and drill through rock that has different characteristics and things uh drilling systems in uk have have something that has been pretty good um but not really integrate it into a dome type simulator and everything else. So yeah, maybe that's an opportunity for the university. Yeah. Hey, yeah, Tony. I just, yeah, good. Sorry, pretty. No, uh, good. No, I mean, I guess I was going to say like, you know, when I get on an airplane and you know, I know that they're using their autopilot, but I have faith in my pilots because I know that they have to go through this rigorous training and so on and so forth. And so I just get, I guess, scared at the idea of, you know, handing over control to the machines and then the people who control the machines aren't really, you know, paying attention and not, I'm not saying they're not paying attention, but they just don't have that, that, that background or that experience to actually pick up when things are going wrong because they're so used to the machine doing their thinking for them. But obviously, like you said, it's, but it, but it's it, a work it, in progress, but it just, yeah. it makes me super anxious when I think about it. But it was interesting, Isabel, we talked to the airlines when we were first building it and uh, they, you know, which was totally, I, I, I thought the pilots adopted autopilot quite well, but apparently they didn't. 
So <laughs> as the early versions of autopilot were coming out in the 70s and 80s, they, they complete, they hated it, they ignored it. The same behavior pattern of uh, driller is I can fly this thing across the Atlantic better than the machine can. And so most of the time in, in, in those days when a lot of us were children, we realized why we were getting a coffee in, the, in our laps was because the pilot was trying to fly the plane, yeah? And not the uh, autopilot, yeah? But I, I yeah, uh, that, that cultural change was as tough in the airline industry as it, as it was in, in, it is in drilling today, I think, yeah. For sure. Cool. Yeah, thanks. Hey, Tony, I have, I have a couple of questions. Uh, uh, they're kind of more on the business side. Uh, yeah. Uh, and I'm sure you probably uh, uh, have, uh, you can probably throw some light on that. Uh, you know that, and of course, the drilling contractors, they get still get paid a day rate, right? Yeah. And, um, uh, and there are, there's talk about uh, them getting paid based on performance, uh, yeah. which is kind of, you know, uh, generally tied to speed. Yeah. How <laughs> fast do you do? Uh, uh, with automation, uh, what you may get is not necessarily speed, mm -hmm. but consistency. Yeah. Consistency. So, th so that's really interesting, Pretty. We, we had a chance uh, last year, uh, in, in two, yeah, 2019, and we, we sat down with um, uh, a, an operator and a drilling contractor and uh, lined up this really cool thing with a, with a, with a standard deviation. So, so re repetitive, so today's status quo w was still going to be well compensated. Yeah? But this operator wanted us to introduce ne new technology so they would then reward you for driving towards the left side of the standard deviation. And then if you uh, didn't perform and you lost that consistency, then you would, you would, you would lose money. But the really long tail of ca catastrophic uh, failures, which were often outside of the drilling contractors control, that tail would have been protected. Yeah. And uh, we, we were getting some really good momentum on doing that. Yeah. And then uh, the crash came. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think, I think you're absolutely right. I think the business model is not designed you know, we're seeing that right now at the moment that uh, um, I, I, I've been I've been working nights the last two weeks fixing some problems in Norway. Yeah. Um, and most of those are driven by the incorrect KPIs for the drilling contractor relative to the operation. Yeah. So the uh, the 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 drilling contractor is paid a bonus on tripping fast. Yeah. So they are shredding the well bore and tearing up the drill string. Yeah. But yeah, because they get more money if they pull the uh, the assembly out the hole faster. Yeah, so uh, it, it's yeah, wrong uh, wrong KPIs and wrong business models. You know, I think there's gonna, they're going to drive some big changes. I think in the next couple of years because uh, you know the number one starter is that I don't know there's a drilling contractor out there that isn't broke or close to it. Yeah, at the moment. Yeah, so something's going to have to change. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Hi, uh, Tony. This is Maggie Chen. Hi, Maggie. Uh, hi. Yeah. Uh, uh, very nice uh, introduction talk uh, today. So I have a question. I heard you mentioned a uh, wind turbine. Uh, could you please uh, elaborate more on that part? Uh, and also, what type of uh, research uh, do you foresee we can uh, participate? Well, I'll tell you what we're doing. Uh, so. Um, wind uh in well wind certainly in the uh western side of uh, europe um offshore wind offshore floating wind is mm -hmm. looking like a uh viable business yeah okay so we're looking at uh building uh equivalent of semi-submersible rigs but with a uh very large wind turbine on you know almost uh, one and a half, two times the size of fixed wind turbines. So you only need about 13 of them to produce the equivalent power of a coal fire power station. Yeah. So, okay. the, so UK and Norway are looking at that. And so uh, we are, as we're going down the digitalization path, we're thinking, you know, trying to expand out of what we're tied to in oil and gas. Mm -hmm. And obviously, 
instrumentation and digitalization in, in remote places mm. is a lot of the cases with uh, solar and wind. They're out in the middle of the desert or out in West Texas where the wind howls through there. Um, so how can we capture data in those remote places, feed it to the people so they can do clever analytics on turbine performance and, and things like that, yeah. Yeah, so remote, uh, like a, a control, right? So still based on the data and then we can remotely control them and also optimize the performance. Correct, yeah. and Reduce the maintenance, right? Yeah, yeah. so we, we certainly, if you have a, uh, you know, uh, projects, we certainly can do that yeah. uh, through rapid, yeah. Cool, and uh, you know, and having an understanding of how one turbine interacts with another turbine, you know, right, right. The turbulence is a, obviously a major problem with them. The, exactly. The ones on the back of the uh, of the array are not getting anywhere near the wind of the ones on the front. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like a wake, you know, like yeah. a, a wing farm. Yeah, we can do that. That is a fluid analysis. Yeah, so we can uh, also help in that uh, uh, aspect. Yeah. Very yeah. cool. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I, I saw you have a 9 to 12 uh, megawatts of uh, that large wind turbine. That's a huge, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Cool.